tied around this from the sticky plaster, put the plaster over her mouth, put that pillowcase or whatever it was, and the cushion cover over her head, put her into the sleeping bag, and now I just slung it in the corner. The voice you just heard is of a psychopath killer who's calmly talking about a girl whom he abducted on July 14th, 1990. What makes it chilling is when the officer who responded to the scene to capture him found out that the abducted girl was actually the officer's own daughter. Shockingly, as the investigation deepened, he revealed that she wasn't his only victim. Even one of his victims who managed to break free from his attack still carries the weight of the tragedy. I grabbed hold of his testicles and he says something like, you bitch. I was, he was trying to get me into the van and I was screaming for my mom. But I knew my mum couldn't hear me. While tracing back to the victims, the one victim who stood out the most was a girl from the UK whose lifeless body was discovered by a passerby in a ditch near the M1 motorway in Twycross on July 18th, 1983. The sight was grim. The girl was completely unclothed and in an advanced state of decomposition. After the body was checked by doctors to find out what happened, it got even harder to figure out who she was because her body was in bad shape and there were no dental records to help. But then they were faced with a devastating reality. There was already a missing case of a young girl on which an intense investigation was going on. So the police decided to call in the parents of the girl as they wondered if it could be their missing daughter. As soon as the couple arrived at the station, their world fell apart when the police showed them the lifeless body of the girl. It was a gut-wrenching moment for them to realize that their precious Carolyn Hogg was gone forever. For the coroner who checked her body, it looked like someone covered her mouth and nose to stop her from breathing and then left her there. Given her state, they also found signs of assault on her. This made the police more puzzled because if the person didn't want to kill her, why did he assault her and leave her where others could find her body? Unlike any other killer, he didn't try to cover his tracks. They also considered the psychological possibility that the person who did this might have thought that it was okay to do bad things to Carolyn because she was unconscious and there was no need to kill her. He might have believed that as long as he didn't get caught or have to face anyone about it, he could still think what he did wasn't really wrong. Four different police departments teamed up to launch one of the biggest murder investigations. They figured that the killer must have used a vehicle to get to such a remote spot to commit the crime. So they kept watch on the roads near where Carolyn's body was found and jotted down license plate numbers just in case the killer returned to the area. As the investigation went on, several people came forward with crucial information that became the center of the case. The day Carolyn went missing on July 8, 1983, they saw a scruffy looking balding man wearing horned rimmed glasses acting suspiciously around Carolyn while she was playing. They observed him following her to a nearby fairground. Along the way, a girl named Jennifer Booth noticed Carolyn sitting with the man on a bench. She overheard Carolyn saying, yes, please, to something the man asked her, and then they walked together hand in hand to the fairground. At the fair, the man paid for Carolyn to ride a carousel while he watched her. One witness even told the police that when they left the fair around 7.30 p.m., Carolyn looked scared. Sadly, that was the last time anyone saw Carolyn alive. After collecting the accounts of the witnesses, the police worked quickly to find the bald man with all those distinctive features, but despite their efforts, they couldn't track him down. Hector Clark from Northumbria Police was chosen to take charge. He set up special rooms and police stations in Northumberland and Leith to help the different forces work together and share information. At this point, the police only had two clues about the killer. The van he used to travel and his appearance described by witnesses because of how the crime happened and where, it seemed like the killer acted on opportunities that arose. As the police kept working hard to solve the case, they felt really worried because time was ticking by and the killer was still on the loose. There was no suspicious activity from his side for the next three years, but the investigation was still going on. They were afraid that if they didn't catch the killer soon, another girl might meet the same fate as Carolyn. Sadly, their worst fears came true sooner than they expected. Sarah Harper disappeared running an errand to the corner shop. On April 19, 1986, the Yorkshire police received a frantic call when a man who was out walking his dog stumbled upon a disturbing sight. A girl's partially clothed body, gagged and tied up, 
was floating in the River Trent near Nottingham. When the police arrived at the scene, they were deeply shocked to discover that the victim was actually Sarah Harper, who had been kidnapped on March 26, 1986, around 7.50 p.m., while she was on her way to a nearby shop from her house. Sarah's body was rushed for an autopsy, where experts revealed the tragic news. The injuries that Sarah suffered from was that she had rather minor bruises to her head, she had some gripping injuries to her arm, she had very, very severe and awful injuries, the worst I have ever seen. Um, and these had been inflicted during life. Um, we subsequently established by scientific means that she, the actual cause of her death was drowning. In other words, she was still alive before she was put into the water. Now, the police also started feeling the pressure, and amid the chaos, they recalled that Sarah had visited a local shop before she went missing. They decided to visit the shop to gather more information about her last whereabouts and movements. While speaking with the shop owner and showing Sarah's picture, the police learned something odd. The shop owner confirmed the strange part. A balding man had also entered the shop briefly after Sarah, then left right after she made her purchases. After leaving the shop, Sarah was last seen by two girls walking towards an alley leading to her home. This meant that Sarah was still alive at 7.55 p.m., but where did she go after leaving the shop? Again, who was that bald man? The West Yorkshire police didn't stop there and went the extra mile and conducted thorough investigations with everyone in the community who had seen Sarah on the day she disappeared. Their hard work paid off when they discovered that a white Ford Transit van was spotted in the area where Sarah was kidnapped from. Even more suspicious was when they got to know that two men were seen hanging around near the path Sarah would have taken to the corner shop. One of them was described as being stocky and balding. Initially, the police were still wondering if it was just a coincidence that the same van and bald man were spotted near both scenes. But days after Sarah's body was discovered, more people came forward with important information. One witness told the West Yorkshire police that around 9.15 p.m. on March 26, he saw a white van parked near the River Soar, with a stocky, balding man standing by the passenger door. Since the River Soar connects to the Trent, and the description matched those given by residents in Morley, this time, investigators took the eyewitness account seriously. Police who were investigating Sarah's murder soon figured out that the person who killed her probably drove on the M1 motorway before getting rid of her body in the river. They knew he must have stopped to refuel his vehicle along the way, because to cover that distance, it would have been imperative to refuel the vehicle. So officers from both West Yorkshire and Nottingham Police started talking to workers and drivers at all the service stations on the M1 motorway between Woolley, West Yorkshire and Trowell, Nottinghamshire. They wanted to know if anyone had seen anything strange on March 26th or 27th. At one service station, workers remembered seeing a white transit van on the evening of March 26th. Unfortunately, they couldn't give a clear description of the driver. However, this small piece of information triggered a massive nationwide search for the man linked to Sarah's murder. As investigators dug deeper into the details, they uncovered such shocking revelations that would turn the case into a whole new direction. In 1986, Detective John Stainthorpe of West Yorkshire Police reviewed the case files after hearing the details and the description of the suspect. Initially, he didn't link Sarah's disappearance to Carolyn's murder. And I would like to make it quite clear, there is no firm evidence at this stage of the inquiry to link the murder of Sarah with any other murder. However, one committed sergeant, despite holding a junior rank, refused to stay silent. Sergeant Bob Bolt highlighted striking parallels between Sarah Harper's and Carolyn Hogg's murders. Caroline was abducted about 7 o'clock at night on a Friday, and Sarah about 7 o'clock, 7 or 8 o'clock on a Wednesday. The difference with Sarah is that uh, she was actually abducted on the Wednesday prior to a bank holiday. So all these led me to believe that the person who abducted would be a non-skilled or semi-skilled worker who had some connections uh, working up north but lived or had to travel back for the weekends down south. Oddly, their bodies were discovered within just 26 miles of Ashby de la Zouch in Leicester, England, 
and little effort was made to conceal them. While Sarah's body was relatively intact, the other victims had decomposed, complicating assessment of their injuries. This variation posed challenges in understanding the cases and reconstructing events. Finally, by November 1986, Sarah's murder was officially linked to the series of crimes, revealing that the same bald individual who abducted them in a white van was responsible for both Carolyn and Sarah's deaths. After the meeting, investigators sought FBI assistance to create a psychological profile of the murderer as they believed it was crucial to understand the killer's pattern and behavior. The FBI worked on this profile and finished it up in early 1988, providing valuable insight that could help the UK investigators understand the mind of the killer, but it seemed really strange for them. According to this profile, the killer was probably a white man, somewhere between 30 and 40 years old, leaning more towards 40. They described him as a classic loner, someone who kept to himself and didn't have many friends. The profile deduced that he collected souvenirs from his victims, which is a classic killer trait. After analyzing the profile, the police realized that they were dealing with a killer unlike any they'd encountered before. There was something deeply sinister about him, and they needed to solve the cases soon. But just when they thought they might have a lead, more disturbing incidents started to surface. It was clear that the killer wasn't planning to stop anytime soon, and the urgency to catch him only grew stronger as another girl was about to be his next victim. On April 24th, 1988, a worried couple rushed into the Nottingham police station with their 15-year-old daughter, Teresa Thornhill, who was visibly terrified. Teresa explained to the police what had happened with her earlier that evening. She'd been hanging out with her boyfriend, Andrew Beeston, and as she walked home after parting ways with him, she noticed a transit van slowing down in front of her on Norton Street. I was walking up the street and this blue van parked on the opposite side of the road and this bloke got out. He went to, went to open his bonnet and he shouts, Oi! You know, looking around, ignoring. Oi, can you fix vans? Took no notice. And then next minute, big guy come along, got me from the side with my arms pinned to my side and got his hand over my mouth and my nose, which I couldn't hardly breathe, ready for passing out. Teresa fought back with all her strength. She wriggled and kicked him in a desperate attempt to break free from his tight hold. In a brave move, she also grabbed onto his tentacles, which caused him to loosen his grip just enough for her to sink her teeth into his forearm. The man yelled at her, but Teresa refused to give up. She screamed for her mother as she struggled against him, even using her feet to push against the doorframe of the van. Just when things seemed bleak, Teresa's boyfriend, Andrew, came running to her rescue. Eventually, Andrew heard me scream, and he jumped over a fence nearby, and um, he sort of like stopped at the corner of the street, and he shouts, oh, you've never go. The guy panics, looks up the street, thinks, oh no, somebody's seen me, gets in his van, and uh, he drove off. Interestingly, the whole incident was captured in a bank security camera, but it only captured Teresa and Andrew running away from the abductor, but wasn't able to capture that man. When the police asked them to describe the man who tried to abduct Teresa, they both gave a detailed description of the man as unkempt, overweight, balding, and built like a wrestler. When the police compared this description to the profile they'd built to the killer from previous cases, it was a chilling match. Finally, they were convinced that they were on the trail of the same dangerous individual responsible for the string of killings and abductions of the girls. As two years passed without any further activity from them, the community grew restless and demanded answers that the police struggled to provide. They continued to pursue every lead and refused to let the investigation grow cold or come to a halt. On July 14, 1990, the police received a disturbing call from a woman who, in a trembling voice, informed them that someone had abducted her daughter in a transit van. Within minutes, a fleet of six police vehicles descended upon the village and were met with a mother who told them about the eyewitness of her daughter's abduction. The witness was David Herkes, a 53-year-old retired postmaster who was out mowing his front garden when he noticed a transit van stopping across the road. The driver stepped out and appeared to be cleaning his windscreen. At that moment, he also saw his neighbor's six-year-old daughter passing by. 
As David bent down to clear grass from his lawnmower, he spotted something strange. Next instance, the child's feet were beside his, then it disappeared. The driver was making a pushing motion to the passenger's floor area. I thought, oh, he's not put a child on the floor. But the child never appeared in the seat or above the dash, so it had to be the case. With a sense of urgency, the driver then rushed to the driver's seat, closed the passenger door, and started the engine. It was a sudden and suspicious sequence of actions that left David feeling deeply unsettled, and he couldn't shake off the feeling that something wasn't right. David had the presence of mind and understood that he'd just seen an abduction unfold before his eyes. He quickly remembered the van's license plate number as it drove away and hurried to the girl's house and urgently relayed the alarming situation to her mother. As David started describing the van to the officers, he suddenly spotted it driving towards them. With a sense of urgency, he explained, that's him, that's the same van. And without any hesitation, an officer stepped in front of the van, bringing it to a sudden stop. The police wasted no time in pulling the driver out of the van and putting him in handcuffs. To their shock, it turned out that the man behind the wheel was 37-year-old Robert Black, as he was never on the radar throughout their whole investigation. In a tense moment, one of the officers climbed into the back of the van and called out for the victim to ensure she was safe inside. As he approached a sleeping bag, he noticed there was some movement in it. With growing concern, he carefully untied the drawstring and to his shock, he found that the next victim of Robert was actually the officer's own daughter. The girl, hidden in a sleeping bag, tied, ganked, with a bag over her head. Unfortunately, despite the police's quick action and the speedy arrest of Robert, he had already assisted the girl. Meanwhile, on the way to the police station, Robert made a disturbing statement that raised serious questions and doubts about his mental health and intentions. It was a rush of blood to the head. I've always liked girls since I was a lad. I tied her up because I wanted to keep her until I dropped a parcel off. I was going to let her go. Also during the search of Robert's van, authorities uncovered several disturbing pieces of evidence. Various restraining devices like ropes, sticking plaster, and hoods, along with a Polaroid camera, a lot of articles on girls' clothing, a mattress, and a selection of intimate adult aids. Robert's explanation for it was unsettling as he claimed to dress in children's clothing during his long-distance deliveries before doing things for his pleasure and offered no plausible reason for this behavior and intimate adult aids. At the request of Scottish detectives, the Metropolitan Police also searched Robert Black's lodgings in Stamford Hill. Inside, they discovered a significant collection of ch- magazines, books, photographs, and videos including 58 videos and films depicting graphic that Robert claimed to have purchased in continental Europe. Among the findings were several items of clothing, six pairs of spectacles, and a copy of a Nottingham newspaper detailing the 1988 attempted abduction of Teresa Thornhill stained with male bodily fluid. These findings only provided further insight into Robert's disturbing activities. Meanwhile, after being charged with abduction of all the girls, Robert was moved to Peter's Head Prison, where, in December 1990, Detective Clark arranged for a recorded interview with him. He selected Detectives Andrew Watt and Roger Orr to lead the interview and instructed them to approach Robert without any judgment. This six-hour session aimed to delve into Robert's mindset and gather crucial information about his past actions and motivations. Robert also freely revealed his series of and his early self As the interview began, Robert recalled the chilling encounter with his first victim, Jennifer Cardi, whom he lured to the park with promises of showing her a kitten. In the park, in Greenock, at the swings, and all the other kids had gone except for the one girl. And I asked her if she wanted to see, let's see, a kitten. And I knew where there was kittens. And she came with me. And so we were going into the, what was it, an area shelter? She said, uh, it was dark. She wanted to get out again. She started to cry. I think I clapped my hand over her mouth, held her down on the ground, with my hand round her throat, and holding her down. And uh, she must have gone unconscious anyway. And uh, there. And went out, left her. You didn't know that she was alive or dead? No. However, his intentions took a dark turn as he pressed her throat too hard, 
intending to render her unconscious and assaulted her. But tragically, he didn't realize that he'd accidentally caused her death. Six days later, two anglers stumbled upon Jennifer's lifeless body in a reservoir near a lay-by in Hillsborough, which was 16 miles away from her home. After an examination by a pathologist, it was revealed that there were signs of on Jennifer's body. The autopsy report determined that she died from drowning, likely as a result of ligature strangulation. According to the interviewer, when Robert described the first killing, he mentioned she must have gone conscious anyway, which meant that for him, violating the girl after luring her to the site was perfectly admissible in his eyes as the victim was unconscious. To Robert, as long as he was not being caught in the act or had to face a confrontation, he kept his beliefs intact that none of his actions were to be seen as a crime. I'd be uh, driving along and see a young girl. I'd go out and talk to her and try to persuade her to get in the van. And uh, take her somewhere quiet. Robert Black was born on April 21st, 1947 in Grangemouth, Stirlingshire. However, Robert's fascination with his disturbing interests only intensified as he grew older. The memories of his past experiences lingered deeply within him, shaping his state of mind and fueling his dark fantasies as he recounted them and revealed the extent of his troubled psyche. I remember one Christmas, I didn't get no Christmas presents because I'd been bad. I got one present from somebody that lived out of town. It was a football. I can't remember what I'd done, you know, but she says, Santa Claus isn't coming this year to you. And he didn't. Despite yearning for a simple, normal life like other children, he was denied that chance. The metaphor of Santa Claus symbolizes his longing for the joys and innocence of childhood, which never became a reality for him. The place where I used to go to get, where I first discovered the shop down near King's Cross in London, didn't have a name, it was just like a shop front, and you went in and it was like the old books lined up, but you wanted to get something else, you went in the back. No, I made the chance for Mark. I, I said to uh, Eddie, any like, teenage magazines? He says, I've got these, and he pulled them out. They're called Lolly Tots. In my mind, the ideal situation would be that I was completely willing and eager. Oh. Somebody once said to me that their motto was, uh, when they're big enough, they're old enough. I tended to agree with that. Robert described his introduction to and said that his ideal situation would be a child who is willing and eager to experience the fantasies he has. Mostly in such characters, the abusers tend to be physically attracted to their victims due to their inability to defend themselves, making them the ideal target for predators. But for Robert, he desired for his victims to be willingly enthusiastic to the physically performed acts. I don't understand myself. I ask myself, why? I got this fascination of weakness or whatever I want to call it. As the interrogator questioned him, he struggled to articulate his reasons, feeling lost and confused. A tendency to neutralize his actions by justifying it again and again. When he was describing his childhood, unlike most killers, he was not exactly looking for a sympathetic approach, but instead was trying to convince himself that his transgressive actions were nothing but a reaction of what he went through in childhood. Seems strange, but you don't want to hurt they die. You didn't hit the dying. You said that you didn't want her to suffer. Whatever you were going to do, you didn't want her to be in pain. There's sometimes, you know, think about being unconscious rather than a, 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 a something like that. Robert described how he didn't have any intentions of hurting any of these children, and by making them unconscious, he was somehow taking them out of their misery. Robert used a certain vocabulary to express his acts in a way where he didn't seem to be affected by the actions. He simply described the killings in a way that took his victims out of their misery, minimizing the sense of guilt as the victims weren't tortured. There was a girl on their own in the flats when I was delivering sit down and talk to her for a few minutes later. Try and touch her. Sometimes succeeded, sometimes not. Like, I'm a okay. Following the interview, investigators had a clearer understanding of Robert's crimes and the motives driving his actions. They diligently worked to gather more evidence against him, aiming to construct a solid case before his court appearance. 
Finally, on May 19, 1994, in a courtroom at Moots Hall Court in Newcastle, Judge William McPherson delivered the verdict. Robert was found guilty after a trial for the abductions and murders of Carolyn Hogg and Sarah Harper, along with the attempted abduction of Teresa Thornhill. In a stern declaration, Judge McPherson labeled Robert as a predator of offenses that would likely never be forgotten and portrayed him as a man at his most despicable. Consequently, Robert received a life sentence with a minimum tariff of 35 years. However, the legal saga surrounding Robert was far from over. By 2009, new evidence emerged which linked him to the murder of Jennifer Cardi. The case against Robert regarding Jennifer's murder didn't rely solely on forensic evidence, but on various details pointing to his presence near the abduction site. On October 27, 2011, Robert was convicted of Jennifer's abduction and murder. Obviously, the conclusion of a very lengthy and indeed, I think, traumatic trial for everybody involved, as Robert Black uh, has been found guilty of the kidnapping and uh, murder of Jennifer Carty. Robert met his end from a heart attack at HMP Magaberry on January 12, 2016, when he was 68 years old. His body was cremated at Roselawn Crematorium near Belfast on January 29th. Surprisingly, no family or friends attended the service, marking his solitary departure from this world. Even in death, suspicions lingered around Robert, linking him to numerous other unsolved murders. With ongoing investigations, more names might eventually be connected to his dark legacy. Let's hope that all the victims of Robert and those innocent souls found peace at last.